With climate change well on its way, disrupting habitats for almost all life on Earth, we've got a lot to lose. And we might be already losing more than we think. Hey guys, Julia here with Will from SourceFed. Some estimates say we're currently in the middle of a sixth mass extinction. A study published in the journal Science Advances found that animals are going extinct 100 times faster than they should be. Another analysis by the World Wildlife Fund and the Zoological Society of London says nearly half of all wildlife on this planet disappeared in the last 40 years. The scientific consensus is that this mass extinction is thanks to us, and we could lose ourselves too. But even if we can stop climate change now and devote more resources to stop this mass extinction, we might still end up losing some critical species. So it's time to make like Noah and seriously ask ourselves, who should we save? So there's this idea out there that we only save the cute cuddly creatures like the panda, or charismatic megafauna as they're sometimes called. Think of things like lion, polar bears, and whales. They're usually large or handsome or cute, and they need our help. These larger animals may be more at risk from climate change. And as charismatic as they might be, they've got some haters. Some worry they soak up all the limelight, leaving little funds or attention for other species that might need some saving too. But on the other hand, mega fans of these megafauna say that saving them might help other species too, and they might be right. So let's get back to the panda. I usually like mine express, but a recent study published in the journal Conservation Biology found that maybe saving the panda won't leave others behind in the dust. Right. The researchers focused on biodiverse hotspots, which are areas where there are a greater number of different kinds of species, and they found that 96% of the panda's range overlaps with areas identified as the most important hotspots. So that's good news for the other animals that live there. Some of the species, 14 mammal, 20 bird, and 82 amphibian species are vulnerable. They're inadequately protected and considered threatened by the IUC. Yeah. And like the paper was titled, these species are now sheltered under the protective umbrella of the giant panda. So pandas become an umbrella species. By protecting pandas and their environments, it also helps the other vulnerable animals who live there too. So think of them as animal ambassadors. Scientists have a hard time getting most people to care about endangered ferns or the Lord Howe Island stick insect, but maybe by saving their cuter neighbors, we can protect them by proxy. So while the concept of umbrella species might be a new one, keystone species are not. Keystones are the topmost stone in an arch. They're the piece that holds the arch in place and keeps it standing. And that's just what keystone species are. They are the type of animals that perform a unique and crucial role in maintaining an ecosystem. If they disappear, things go south pretty quickly. The best example of this is the story of gray wolves in Yellowstone National Park. Gray wolves once roamed much of the United States, but with tales like Little Red Riding Hood, wolves became the enemy. Many feared for their families and their livestock. Throughout the 1800s, they were mercilessly hunted to protect homesteads and ranches. And from 1914 to 1926, a concentrated effort wiped the wolf off the map. And in the blink of an evolutionary eye, one of the country's top predators was gone. But once the wolves disappeared, the ecosystem was dramatically altered. Cottonwood trees and aspen trees started to disappear too. Several studies published in the journal Ecological Applications and in the Journal of Forest Ecology and Management linked the decline of the cottonwoods starting in the 1920s to a lack of wolves in Yellowstone. One of the studies found that without wolves, elks could feed without fear of being hunted, so they started grazing wherever they liked and essentially eating all the young cottonwood seedlings. Without the cottonwoods, stream and riverbeds quickly became eroded, making things worse for the watery areas. So humans hatched a plan to put things right. In 1995, 21 Canadian wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone. Once wolves returned to the park, the elk population declined thanks to hungry wolves. And now the ecosystem appears to be heading back in the right direction. The researchers found that streamside brush and cottonwood trees are recovering. But it wasn't just the plants that benefited from the wolves' returns. Willows, songbirds, beavers, and many other species suddenly flourished, according to a study published in the journal Science. And what's more exciting, the authors of this study looked at other possible keystone species, and they believe methods like reintroduction would benefit other fragile ecosystems too. Okay, so maybe wolves aren't the best example. I mean, they are just as charismatic as they are a keystone. But how about a starfish in the Pacific Northwest? Better example and definitely less cute. This little guy isn't particularly pretty, but he's super important. In a controlled experiment in 1966, Robert Payne removed the starfish species from a small controlled area. After a year, the whole neighborhood changed, kind of like when rich people build condos in poor neighborhoods. Within a year of the starfish's removal, the number of species dropped from 15 to 8. By removing one of the type of animal, the entire food web suffered. These starfish actually were the first species to be ever dubbed as keystone. So maybe conservationists should focus their limited resources on protecting these species, even if they're less than aesthetically appealing. By saving wolves or sea stars, we might just keep a delicately balanced web in place. And if we're lucky, we might just save ourselves in the process. Hey Will, thanks for joining us. Where can they find more of you? I just launched my brand new channel, People Be Like. If you want to check it out, be sure to check out one of my latest videos where I talk about something topical. Isn't it time we recognize the scorpion for what it is? 
before it strikes again. I'm so confused. Are we using bugs as political metaphors now? It's pretty topical, pretty interesting. So make sure you watch that video. There's a link in the description if you're on mobile and subscribe so you never miss an episode.